Alan Rutberg. I'm director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy. Uh, welcome to our first Animal Matters talk of spring semester. Uh, this semester we're taking a slightly different tack, or at least one that the center hasn't visited for a while. We're going to be talking about animals and art. And so today we are privileged to have um, Rick and Laura Brown to, from Hans House Studio. Um, Hans House Studio, which they will tell you about more than I will, um, is a nonprofit, innovative educational organization that creates adventurous hands on projects through community service, building projects with nonprofit partners, including us around the world, as a way to explore history, understand science, and perpetuate the arts. Um, they're both on the faculty at Massachusetts College of Art and Design down in Back Bay, um, and they've had a number, they, um, They've been honored in a number of different ways, which um, are too numerous for me to go through because I want to, to turn it over to them um, to talk about Toys for Elephants and their project with the Buttonwood Zoo. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Rick Brown. This is Laura Brown. And uh, we're both co-founders of Hans House Studio. The first thing I want to do is uh, thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to, to speak to you today. This will be the first time uh, we've spoken to uh, a veterinary school, and, and uh, although we have been working with this project uh, with animals for seven years, so. Um, but anyway, Laura and I are both trained sculptors, and uh, we met in our school uh, n back in 1970. That, that'll date us. We've been married for 47 years. Uh, we, we are dedicated makers. I mean, ignore that hand, but we're dedicated makers, <laughs> and, uh, and and this is and, and this is how we kind of evolved into these making toys for elephants. And I want to tell you a little bit about that as we go. But I have so many things I want to tell you, and we have don't have enough time. So let's let's get rolling. Uh, we live four f full lives. Uh, one of those uh, lives is we have. Um, if this would, uh oh. Okay, hang on. One of those lives is we have a family. We have three children. They're all married, and they all have two children. But I'm not going to talk about them, okay? Not today. That's, I'm not going to talk, talk about that life. Also, we are full-time faculty at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. And so, uh, again, I'm not going to talk about that specifically today. But that's another one of our full-time lives. Also, we have a, uh, an active uh, art-making uh, practice. We're both sculptors. We've been making large-scale environmental sculpture since the mid-1970s. We continue to do that today, and we exhibit all over the U.S. and then also different parts of the world. I'm not going to talk about that. But you can see we are, we're makers, okay? And uh, so, uh, next slide. This is Hans House Studio. We, we, uh, built this building and started in 1995. It took us five years. We built the thing ourselves. And uh, by 2003, we had created uh, an official nonprofit 501c3. And, uh, and we already were up and running. And what we do is we create large historic objects uh, as educational projects. We're really de dedicated to learning, making and learning, learning by doing. So uh, I'll, I'll read this quickly. The hand is the cutting edge of the mind. Civilization is not a collection of finished artifacts. It is the elaboration of process. In the end, the march of man is the refinement of the hand in action. This is written by Jacob Bernowski, who was a mathematician turned uh, uh, anthropologist, and he wrote the book Ascent of Man back when we were in college, like many of you are today. And we, we embraced this idea of the hand is the cutting edge of the mind because we were dedicated, impassioned young makers. Okay, So this is how we perpetuate this idea through our Hans House studio. Very early on in Hans House, some really amazing projects came our way. One was, uh, this is back in 1999, PBS's NOAA was trying to establish uh, or determine a way that the Egyptians would raise obelisks, you know, these monolithic stones that sometimes are over 100 tons. They're trying to come up with an arguable way that they did that. We competed to be part of that project, and we, our idea was accepted, and so we had the opportunity to raise this 33-foot, 55,000-pound stone uh, using the Hans House pedagogy. So but this is the kind of project we started with. It it's, uh, actually put us on the international stage right in the beginning. Uh, shortly after that, we built this, uh, uh, the first true uh, submersible, the first true submarine 
built in uh, 1775 in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Another fantastic hand house project because what this is made of is uh, copper raising, glass blowing, bronze casting, uh, traditional blacksmithing, carving, and uh, and so this is the kind of thing we like to do. We, we try, try to replicate objects using the exact same tools, the exact same process that they did when the object was originally made. Okay, so. Uh, that was another project we did. It said, again, what we do is we have these intensive workshops. We built this in 12 days with 75 people at Hans House in Norwell, Massachusetts. Artists, craftsmen, educators, and students all work together shoulder to shoulder to replicate the object as accurately as possible from the beginning to the end. So students are working next to professionals from all over the world. Okay? After the 12 days, we took it to Duxbury Harbor and we stuck it in the water and, and, and our project worked. Okay? So, after that, uh, because we were, again we're working for the Discovery Channel, we made arrangements to take it to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Now we're working with the best submariners in the world. So our submarine got to be tested in their tank. This is the kind of the kind of projects we've been able to work with, and, and the kind of people we've been working with. Interjection: This will now be shown at the Spy Museum yeah, yeah. in Washington D.C. Yeah. when it opens in 2019. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so another idea is we don't start with a subject, we always start with an object. So basically we'll take an image like the one you see on the left. This is a human-powered crane. Human-powered cranes were used to build all the great edifices in Europe from dating back to the first century AD in Rome. Most of us don't know about this history, but it was a, has a very long, very prolific uh, history. So we uh, students will take that object, they'll look at it, they'll ask questions, how was it made, who made it, what were the tools, what were the methods, and then we replicate it as accurately as possible. And when we do that, we start to learn all about the social, political, economic forces that surround that history at that time. So, and we also have this basic concept of learn by doing. So many of these subjects we're working with, we, we know nothing about. We're not trained, we're not experts, but we take them on. And through the process, we learn about this history and are able to reproduce them in a very, with a certain degree of accuracy. So, um, and then that brings us to Toys for Elephants. And now Toys for Elephants is a little bit outside of that pedagogy, except it still is this idea about learning by doing and entering into, into a subject that we know nothing about but, uh, but uh, also it's very, very challenging and compelling. One of the things is, is we came up with this idea that we're going to offer this as a class at Mass College of Art with our students. And, uh, and, and we say, wow, this is really cool. I'm going to get the opportunity to, to actually make toys for elephants. This is fantastic. But what happens is, is, is that the day one, we go down to the zoo and they meet these elephants. And all of a sudden they start to realize through discussions with the people at the zoo, this is a complicated subject. This is a very difficult a social, political, economic subject that uh, elephants are endangered and there's all kinds of political issues. There's a, a large faction of people who are adamantly opposed to animals in captivity. There are people poaching elephants all over Africa. There's a civilization encroaching on their habitats. So all of a sudden students realize that they are now engulfed in a project that's, that's quite significant and, and quite relevant and, uh, and so now their work becomes much more serious and, they, and what they're going to do is they're going to take their skills, their design skills, and try to make the best possible objects for enrichment that they can to enhance the lives of animals in captivity. So the whole attitude changes dramatically once they realize what they've gotten into. <laughs> so um, so I'll, I'll read this so I can move quickly. The Toys for Elephants uh, course we offer uh, is an interface between science and the arts. We like this idea of uh, artists working with scientists. And, uh, and, and sharing our sensibilities and, and, and the things that we can bring together to work to make a synergetic relationship. Also, as well as uh, public service collaboration between three organizations. In this case, it's Hans House Studio, our institution, Mass College of Art, and then the Buttonwood Park Zoo in New Bedford. And uh, the course objective is for students to design and create objects and activities that enhance the quality of life of animals in captivity. So this is our objective. It's a big goal. Students work with biologists, they work with veterinarians, and they work with zookeepers to study animal behavior and prevent two adult elephants from the Buttonwood Park Zoo. And then to design and produce full-scale functioning toys for elephants enrichment. We, use, we capture this idea of toys for elephants because we think that's kind of captivating, but, but the idea is bigger than uh, maybe it might sound like a, a silly project. But we call them toys. So. Animal enrichment is provide. Is for, uh, you have to realize also we're we're starting from the beginning. Many of the things we're going to be talking about here, you're already aware of. But we're starting from the beginning. So, animal enrichment is providing mental and physical stimulation for animals and opportunities to increase the animals' activities, stimulate their brains, promote positive social interaction, and encourage natural behaviors. 
The Toys for Elephants projects provide students an opportunity to take part in this significant real life design problem and the potential to make a better and more sustainable future for animals. So this is a big task we've taken on and, uh, and our students have you know, over the seven years proven that they can actually uh, take this on in a very serious way and, and come with what we believe to be a positive contribution to this, this uh, actual uh, problem in, in, uh, in, in, within the zoo structure. Okay. We, we, we break our class down into four phases. We're, we're trying to do so much in one semester. In a three credit class, elective class, it's, a, it's amazing the amount of stuff we get done. But the first phase is the research phase. So we have to learn so much, so fast, because we, we're starting from zip, from zero. And so um, the first thing we do is we take them to, the, to meet the elephants and the, and the zoo people. And this is where we get a, our, our crash course in, in uh, research. Then they come back to school and we do design and then design development. They're going to brainstorm for uh, objects that they believe are going to, again, uh, satisfy uh, this idea of enrichment in, in a number of ways that they determined from our experience. Okay, then the third phase is the construction phase. That means now they're going to go into actually building these objects themselves. And so in the classroom uh, at Mass College of Oral, we have a diversified student body. We have architects and industrial designers. We have sculptors who are makers. And so they all come together and they share their sensibilities. And uh, in a very short time, they're going to produce these objects. And then the last phase is, and it's not written as four here, it went back to being one, is to uh, actually take the toys to the zoo and introduce them to the elephants. So those are the four, four phases. Okay, so in the research phase, uh, students observe elephants in their current, current habitat. Now in our case, we're working with the Buttonwood Park Zoo and they have two, two elderly elephants. We also interview their biologists and veterinarians and zookeepers, and then we record our information to be somewhat scientific and uh, record our data so we can make some sense of what we're doing over a long period of time. Okay, so. Um, so they're, again, learning from scratch. Now, what, again, like I say, it's, it's all of a sudden it's a big deal, literally, when we go to the zoo and meet Emily and Ruth. Because now students are realizing they're designing for two real, live, beautiful, intelligent creatures. And, and also, it's not like elephants are, 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 can be so generalized. These are very, they have very specific characteristics. They're very intelligent and they're very, have very, they're very personal. So uh, Emily is a 54-year-old Asian elephant, female, and Ruth is a 60-year-old Asian female. And so, um, so Emily and Ruth are, are, are we're very dear to them, and we, we think that they, uh, they smell at mass art student, and they can smell them from great distances. And so they remember us through their sense of smell. Now, what I'm showing you here is, this is a list of student notes. We're working from students digging into the subject, digging in their heels and trying to solve this problem. So here's a list. For example, this is the thing a student wrote. Emily, gender, female, age, 54 years, gener uh, geriatric, size, very large for a female, bull-like, 8,900 pounds, has small protruding tusks, not typical for females. Characteristics, raised in isolation, inadequately socialized, behavioral ver verbal confusion, personality similar to being on the spectrum, limited communication with Ruth, doesn't speak elephant. This is what the, the, the keepers tell us, that she, she can't communicate uh, like uh, elephants. So she has, she has some personal problems. Very food motivated, more independent, does not have normal behavioral cues, can be mean to Ruth, less interested in being social with humans unless there's food involved, okay? So, <clears throat> likes unscrewing bolts. She's very mechanically inclined. If you put her in a room with any, any kind of mechanical thing, she's gonna go over there and start futtering with it and she'll dismantle mantle everything you have in the building that has nuts and bolts, okay? She likes drumming. She loves drumming, and she likes tapping on things. Very responsive to sounds, vibration, and smell. These, these, these notes are very, we have uh, students taking notes like this is a very key part of us understanding the nature of these, these animals. This likes working hard to get food. She doesn't like to work hard. She doesn't like to play. She's, she's old, she, so she doesn't have the, uh, she just physically doesn't like to, to do anything. And also, she's tired of swimming in the pool. She loves to be hosed off with of uh, a water hose and brushed down, but she doesn't like to even walk in the pool. Okay, so I'll go quickly. Here's the Ruth notes. Uh, gender, okay. Uh, are you, are you? So now, just quickly, Ruth is 60 years old, geriatric. She's the third oldest elephant under the AZA certification. So, you know, I, I, we go to zoos. We've been to zoos all across the country. In Portland, Oregon. We've been to zoos in the, uh, Southern California, in the Midwest. All those zookeepers, they know, they know about uh, Ruth because she's, she's this, one of the old, oldest uh, living 
uh, elephants in the country. And so, uh, so that gives, makes her a very, very unique. So she's a natural model for geriatric, geriatric treatment of elephants. Size, smaller than Emily, 7,500 pounds. How's that for small? Uh, okay, but, but about 1,000 pounds less. Um, characteristics, limited movement with a trunk. Middle of her trunk is paralyzed. Both of these elephants were refugees from uh, rough uh, beginnings. And, uh, and so the zoo has, uh, the, they, they've been living now for over 40 years, has really rehabilitated them. But uh, her trunk in the middle part is probably, was probably traumatized by uh, 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 brutality in her, uh, her first four years of her life. So. Um, she, uh, where, where Emily is very, is very big and very strong and has incredibly uh, sensitive movement of her trunk, uh, Ruth has to swing her trunk to, get, to do anything. But once she can swing it up and get it on something, then she can be very sensitive with the, with the end. So it's, uh, it's amazing how, you, how she has that, that limitation, but uh, compensates for her that. So that makes a very unique creature we're working with. Okay, she's more social with humans. She loves to be around people. Uh, difficulty of digesting due to loss of teeth. You know, elephants in their lifetime have rows of teeth that come in and go out. And they wear them out. And they wear them out. And then once they go and go through all those teeth in the in the natural habitat, they probably will die because they can't uh, chew their food enough to digest it properly. And so they. Uh, but in this case, uh, they altered her food source. They chop up her food in smaller pieces. They make smoothies and like pudding. And she's doing fine as long as they keep the food away from Emily because Emily will steal Ruth's food. Okay, so, so she's quick to play with sound, okay? Now also, she likes stepping on things. So for, for toys, if you may get a toy, the first thing she's gonna do is try to crush it, okay? So um, she also is very clever. She tries to outsmart Emily, okay? And she works hard to get treats. She doesn't, she's like, like elephants in the wild who rummage for uh, food, probably 18 hours of a 24 hour day, she's happy rooting around trying to solve problems to find her food. Dislikes. She doesn't, again, she's a old age, she doesn't like to do anything. They, they say they're lazy. Uh, and, uh, and, and she also, she doesn't like to get in the pool either. She just likes when people wash her off with a hose. So, okay, so now so you can see what our students realize is that they're not designing for uh, this generic creature. They're designing for very specific needs of very specific creatures. So this, for art students, this is a challenge that they, they meet head on and they, they take it serious. Okay, so, but you know, again, they're learning from scratch, and so I'm just going to go through this quickly so that I, I can get on to showing some toys. Um, but uh, they're, they're learning about the difference between Asian and African elements, elephants. And uh, they're learning about things like the trunk is the elephant's most important versatile, versatile appendage. It's a lot like a hand. It had, can do so many things, it's incredibly strong. Okay, so uh, beyond what you, we can, uh, uh, you can imagine in a lot of ways. The function of the trunk is for feeding, watering, dusting, Smelling, touching, communicating, and defense. The trunk of an adult Asian elephant can hold up to 10 liters of water. So they can, I wish I had a trunk, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's not gonna happen. Anyway, so, uh, also the almost vertical limbs enable them to stand for long periods of time as well as support the enormous body weight. So their legs are so powerful, but also they need to, they need to exercise. In, in the feet, out in the, in the natural habitat, they, 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 they walk several miles a day and can be walk many, many more miles than that. And they also have complex feet and they need to be moving those feet to keep themselves strong. So it's real important that they exercise their feet daily. And uh, for two elderly elephants, they need to be encouraged. That's why this is a, becomes a design feature that our students can say, okay, I'm gonna make something that gets them to be curious and to make roll these things and kick them with their feet and, and to get exercise, okay? So elephants have extremely developed sense of smell. The nostrils are at the tip of the trunk. They use smell to differentiate between different herd members. So smell is a very important part of the elephant's uh, senses. Elephants can detect scents from a long distances up to several kilometers. So they can be in touch with each other through sense of smell, okay? Now, also their, their visible or visual ability in elephants is limited. They, their poor eyesight is more than compensated by excellent hearing, their sense of smell, and tactile senses, okay? The opening of the mouth of the elephant is small relative to the size of the, of the animal. The digestive, well, let me say this. Uh, these two elephants, they, when we go to meet them, they, they like to grab you with their trunk and put your hand in, on their tongue because they like you to rub their tongue. <laughs> and so uh, art students, I don't know, art students love that. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not so into that. 
But, but anyway, the digestive system of, of an elephant is not very efficient at absorbing nutrients. Elephants digest and absorb only 44% of what they eat. So, you know, of, the, of the, all the food that goes in, 60% goes in and comes right back out the other end. And uh, so they eat lots of food during the course of the day, but they're not getting all the nutrients from that. Elephants can communicate with each other via low frequency sounds over distances of several kilometers. Although groups of elephants may lose visual contact, they don't lose auditory contact. So they can be miles away and still be communicating through the, uh, these, these sound systems. Okay, the highly wrinkled skin helps uh, absorb water and helps retain surface moisture to compensate for of rapid heat loss. Normal, normally the skin is covered with dust, soil, or mud to prevent insect bites, sunburn, and moisture. So it's really important. You see elephants throwing dust on their backs. It's a way to protect themselves from, uh, from the, the environment. Asian elephants are highly intelligent and self-aware. Asian elephants show a wide variety of behaviors, including grief, learning, play, use of tools, compassion, cooperation, self-awareness, memory, and language. That sounds like a description of like a, a five-year-old human being. It, these, they're amazing to work with. Okay, so uh, now, so what we do is, again, uh, what we show you, what we wanted to do today is kind of introduce to you some of the uh, key characters that we're working with uh, in, in the last seven years. And so we're going to show you some little film clips. But we're, what we're doing is going to introduce them with students' questions, authentic questions that students ask uh, in, in the process. So in this question, there's a question a student asks, is it necessary to have animals in zoos? A lot of activists would ask the same question. So this is Dr. Langbauer, who is the former director of the Buttonwood Park Zoo, and he's going to answer that question for you. Yeah, I'd just like to talk about zoos and, and what they're trying to do nowadays. Okay. Um, when, when people think about going to a zoo, usually what they think about is like having a nice time with their family, to you know, see some interesting animals, relax, and, and just have an enjoyable afternoon. And at any good zoo, you actually, you know, you should be able to do this. But behind the scenes, unknown by the public, you know, zoos are undergoing a really vast transformation. They are no longer just um, places for entertainment for, for human beings. They're uh, conservation organizations. Every single major zoo in the entire world has as its mission the conservation of wildlife and the land that um, uh, is needed to do this. Conservation you can do in a whole variety of ways. I mean, one of the biggest predictors of whether someone's going to grow up and have a conservation ethic is whether they've had an oh wow experience with an animal or nature when they're a kid. And if, especially if you're living in an urban area, zoos are the place for that. I mean, you know, you can always see a elephant on TV and it's that big. Okay. You go to a zoo and it's that big, you're this close to it, it stinks, it smells different, it makes noises that make your, your, your chest vibrate and that is a visceral experience well beyond what you can see on TV or read in a book. So just by uh, ex exhibiting animals, you are promoting new generations of conservationists, which is what you need in order for conservation to happen. Um, there's also education programs at zoos. All, zoo all accredited zoos have, uh, have strong education programs. And, you know, of course, it's conservation education. They're not teaching math. They're not teaching quantum physics. They're, they're illustrating conservation principles. And finally, zoos can do real science that, that affects conservation. You can either do science at the zoo or else you can fund field work, and zoos are doing that too. So I think, I think no, I think zoos are, um, I, 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 zoos are now one of the largest, if not the largest, con combined conservation organizations in the world, and I think that um, uh, their power to affect conservation, real change in conservation, is is only uh, expanding and will continue to expand. Uh, another student question. How do you know an elephant is happy? And the person that we have answering that is Keith Lockhart. He's the current uh, director of the Buttonwood Park Zoo. 
When you come to the question of animal happiness, that's a very difficult thing because obviously we would love to be able to ask the animals if they're happy, but you know you don't usually get a great response when you do that. Um, so it, it basically comes down to the question of animal welfare. Um, the zoos are no longer just menageries. There's a lot of science that goes into it. There's a lot of science that looks at them from a behavioral standpoint, really pays um, attention to the social structures and what are the appropriate social structures. And there's even some type of stress hormone analysis that can be done to look at uh, stress levels with captive animals as well. So the science has gone a long way. So you have the science of managing animals, but then you also have the art of managing animals. And at the end of the day, one of the most important things is keepers animal care staff, animal managers who really know their animals. Um, you really need to be able to read the behavior of animals. This is why you've seen a lot of specialty. Um, you have people who are just dedicated to elephants or just dedicated to big cats. Is because they, over the years, they gain that experience that they can really read their animals as much as you can read any animal. And that knowledge, that individual knowledge, not only of the species, but more importantly when you're talking about a zoological institution, of the individual specimens, the individual animals at a zoo, is critical because that is very important to working towards animal happiness, ultimately animal welfare. Okay, another student question, what is animal enrichment? And this is Sarah Cook Martin, she's the assistant director. He started Again, enrichment is one of those zoo. terms that um, old, I think is more to explain to people that aren't in the business, um, you know, what we do on a daily basis. You know, enrichment is just a part of normal husbandry and caring of the animals. It's, it's you know, doing things that are going to stimulate them, providing them with opportunities and choices. It's, it's um, you know, something there's a big focus on, but again, it's something that's always been there and is constantly evolving and changing as well. But it, obviously, it's, it's an important component of husbandry. You want to be able to afford the animals, you know, that we're caring for lots of choices and the ability to express, you know, behaviors that you would see in the wild. And, you know, it's a teaching tool to be able to, again, create that bond with the public so that they have a better, um, you know, understanding for wildlife, appreciation for wildlife, and hopefully that translates into conservation efforts. Okay, this is the last question. Uh, have our toys been effective? So after working for a number of years, students want to know if, uh, if the zoo is happy with what we're, we're doing. Or if, it, or if it's worth it. <laughs> One of the challenges, um, and, and this goes for any zoo, and in particular for a small zoo with a uh, much more modest budget, is that elephants are incredibly intelligent animals. Um, they need to be stimulated. Um, so, and a lot of times stimulation also equates to allowing them to have multiple choices. Uh, we are constantly trying to provide enrichment or, in other words, toys and other manipulative uh, items for the elephants. But one of the biggest challenges of working with elephants is they're incredibly strong, incredibly destructive. So when Mass College of Art and Design approached us and said, hey, we have these students, these bright, uh, creative students who actually have a design background as well, it was a win-win. Because now, not only are we getting the creative design which is coming from the students and coming from the animal care staff at the zoo but we're also getting the design features that they can actually understand well they shouldn't be able to destroy it doesn't always work they sometimes underestimate the strength of the elephants but to get those design principles in with the animal knowledge that comes from the zoo it's been a great opportunity for the elephants who have these great new toys the students who get to work on design principles but also get to learn about elephants and learn about the operations of the zoo and also from the zoo public. The zoo public be able to come in on a special day like that, see Ruth and Emily, they're making vocalizations, they're happy as they can be. Um, it is a win-win all the way across the board. It's working. Yeah, it's definitely working. Um, you know, the students get better and better because I think Rick takes back, you know, what worked, what didn't work and helps sort of guide the students. Um, but, you know, again, they come up with things that are just I, they're amazing it, conceptually and there's more ideas than unfortunately than funds to build a lot of these things so you know really if if the if the money supply is endless the opportunities and the possibilities are endless okay <clears throat> I'm just I want, we're, we're gonna be short on time so I want to kind of motor through this really quickly now we're in the design phase this is show students uh, in, in the studios now they're making models. One of the things we try to get them to do is, is to uh, 
come up with their ideas, they do a lot of drawings, a lot of brainstorming, but to make models that actually are functioning models, they're, 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 they're built to scale, they're, we have, have them make them in the actual materials they're going to build the original in, and, uh, and so they're working with, in teams, and they're also working with faculty members to try to make these things as, uh, as uh, uh, to give us as much information as possible. So they're, like I say again, they're doing brainstorming drawings, th thumbnail sketches, and then uh, measure drawings, and then making models. They might make several models before they actually uh, you know, uh, get to the point of going to make the full-scale model. We probably should move just a little quickly. So, uh, so this is a big part of the process. Model making gives us a lot of very good information and also gives them the opportunity to work with the materials on a smaller scale to know what they're going to be up against when they get to the bigger scale. So again, this is just ex different examples of using different materials, wood, steel, plastics. Then they take their ideas and their presentation boards to this, back to the zoo, and we're, now we're going to present this to, again, the biologists and the veterinarians and the zookeepers and, and the staff, and, uh, and, and try to pitch the ideas and what they're, how they're going to be uh, effective with the elephants to the, to the zoo, and then they'll give us recommendations, and uh, usually they give us very uh, important recommendations, but all, usually they uh, approve all the ideas because they're, they're pretty well developed. Yeah, they want everything. Then the, um, and we, of course we don't mind that, but then the, uh, then the students take the, the same presentations back to the art school and present them to art uh, faculty and art architects and, and uh, industrial design faculty members because there, they're going to start to uh, uh, analyze the, what they've, they've done and make a kind of a hierarchy based on, for example, they say, oh, that's a great idea, but we don't have a budget to build it. Or that's a great idea, but we don't have the skill set to build it. So they create a hierarchy on what's feasible, and so that's, that's the, the next part of, the, of that phase of working. So this is an example of we, we, you know, presenting the work to, uh, to our faculty and, and making a decision. I just want to show you this sort of chart over the last seven years. Uh, we've worked with 134 students. We've come up with 41 different designs, and we've actually uh, built full scale and presented 17 toys. So uh, we've been pretty, pretty active. This is an example of a presentation board. And so you can see in the top right where there's some thumbnail sketches and some brainstorming ideas, and they develop those things. And then they'll make a model, and they maybe make a, several models until it, until it actually functions. And then they'll do some measure drawings. And then they'll Photoshop the thing into the, into the site to get a sense of scale and make it look like it's in, in reality. And they always will give them a title. And, uh, and they also have a little narrative that goes along with that to explain what they're trying to do. And so, uh, uh, so again, each of these have very specific design ideas. For example, in this one, uh, you know, you see in, in the middle, the elephants pick, like to pick up logs and, th and throw them, and, and rocks and throw them. And so uh, this was an idea about building what they called jacks. And, and they built three different sizes, a large, a medium, and small. And, uh, and so they can pick them up and move them around and, pl and play with them, which means it encourages exercise. And they exercise their trunk, and they're walking around exercising their legs and their feet. This is a tire tendril using, again, accessible materials that are inexpensive, which means, again, we can afford to build them. And they're also very durable. Uh, what they say is, is that when you have it uh, with the elephants, you introduce a new toy to them. The first thing they're going to do is go play with it. Uh, then what they're going to try to do is try to eat it. And then they're going to destroy it. That's the three steps. So uh, uh, here, this is an example of making a container for freezing uh, fruit and, and, and maybe vegetables that go inside this chunk of ice. So in the hot summer months, the elephant can get, can get this big popsicle that they can eat and lick. And usually what they do is just step on it and, and, and it, it crush it. And, it's, and so, uh, but uh, it's, they, they love it, and it's a really good, good idea. Okay, and then, uh, again, this is where we'll see. We may, might see a little clip about this if we have time. But uh, again, this idea of a this sort of steel sort of cage with a sound uh, chamber inside, a steel pipe that has a little clapper. So as they roll that, and they're rolling it because they like the sound, it, it, it clangs and makes it like a, like a bell, bell sound. And yeah, you might have to skip a few. You want to skip this one? OK, so I hate to skip these videos of students, but we, because of time, we want to be able to ask, ask questions if you want to. But again, uh, we have, uh, over the years, different presentations and different formats, but this is students presenting their models and their, and their drawings uh, to the faculty at school. And then they go into the construction phase. And this is where now we're really, it's a, the race is on to try to get these projects built before school runs out. And, and we have to get them presented to the zoo, too. So, uh, and then again, what we're doing is relying on our own student skill set. So, uh, and we have students that can do amazing things, but not all of them. So they all work together as teams. So you saw some people doing welding in, in, our, in our welding shop. And you see these two young women here building the, what we call the octolog. This is a very popular toy, has very durable, uh, thick dimensions, and 
Uh, two women here worked on this. Again, a tire, a tire, a tire uh, ball that they, they make. The elephants can push it and step on it. And they uh, put the zookeepers put food in their little snacks so they can have to f pick them out, out. And so, th so that's been a very successful toy. Another steel toy. Another, this is like a puzzle feeder where they have to futzer with it uh, to, get, to get things aligned and uh, get the food out. And so uh, and this is another thing called the bling. We call this the second generation octolog where uh, when the elephants move it, it doesn't go in a straight line. It rolls you know, in, 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 in an axis. And they put food inside. And, uh, and then, I, we, we want to show this clip real quick? No, okay, so we'll have to move on. So this is, um, again, the um, uh, show that uh, the object is, is in its final stages of construction. So the students are working with things and materials and dimensions that can tolerate the forces of the elephant and have a longer life. Uh, this is a tire tendril again. This is the largest thing we've done to this day. It's based on the idea of the Archimedes screw. And what happens is, is that you put apples and oranges in at the bottom. It, it, there's a little chamber, you drop them in. And when, it, when the elephant rolls it around, it has to go through two full rotations. Then all the fruit falls out in the ground and they can get the fruit. As soon as they come out of the barn, they go right to it and they can smell the fruit. And so then they've got to figure out what they're going to do. And then they, you'll, you'll see here, a little, little clip. Just so you see, this is uh, students who have just made this thing. And they're trying, so it's six students trying to roll it. And, uh, but it's nothing for the elephant to do it by themselves. It, we have the whole clip, but we can't go through the whole clip. It's just too long. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and also you can see the scale of that is made where they can, they can push it and they can step on it and they can't, they can't break it. Or that's, that's, what, that's what we say. Okay, same with this. This is another, uh, uh, not a puzzle feeder, but a, a, a sort of physical activity feeder. They, they push it along and f food and like a apples and oranges and uh, uh, things like uh, popcorn, uh, they'll, peanuts they'll put inside and as they roll it, food will fall out. Okay. And this is, uh, this is another one called the uh, dodecahedron, which is a, uh, I mean, kind of based on like a, like a soccer ball, and, but it's made out of steel. And so uh, it has just a few little uh, perforations where they can, the keepers can stuff hay and the elephants can kick it around and they'll step on it and it's steel so they can't bend it. And it's also a, sort, of, sort of a feeder. Okay, so the, the big day is after they've made all these objects uh, and uh, after many late nights and long weekends of working, uh, we take them down to the zoo, and usually the zoo makes arrangements with local schools, so a lot of school kids are there too, at the, day, the day we present the toys. And so there's a lot of excitement. The students, our, our students are so excited about seeing how the elephants are going to respond to what they've made. And then the, uh, the, uh, the zoo is also, the elephants are excited because they have these new toys to play with. And the, the local kids are excited because, again, this, there's this whole thing about seeing the elephants uh, playing with these toys. And so it's a very, a very exciting day. And you know, we go down there on, in the morning and we have to do, some of them have to be installed or you know, built and carried in or actually uh, and bolted into place. So it's a very, uh, very exciting day. And, uh, and so here you're seeing all, some number of these objects you saw before that are being, being installed. And um, so this is like a, a bell, a bell, we have several bells that we made. You know, again, the, we installed the bells, they love the bells. They go out every morning, you open the door, they go out and ring the bells, until Emily realized she could stick her trunk up inside and unscrew the clappers. <laughs> so, so, took all the clappers off. Okay, okay also to go back one more time, this thing, before this one, is called the uh, toy rack. Can you get back? And uh, the students designed the steel uh, rack, so uh, every year you go in, you could take toys off and put new toys on to be, always make it interesting. And so uh, this, the second ge generation, this, this uh, two young women made uh, these a xylophone with pipes and a, and a, and a drum on the, a steel on the end. And, um, and so, uh, the, uh, and of course, Ruth, like, this is it, you can see with the xylophone, see this, the pipes on the backside? Ruth likes to go, she'll pick up sticks in the yard and she'll go and she'll play on it. And she goes, I'll see, see the steel drum on the end, it's actually, uh, you, you pound on that and you get this pounding sound. So we, you know, she, she was pounding on that. But, but within a couple days, Emily found it and, and the, those pipes were bolted on. So, so as soon as she found that, she bumped uh, Ruth out of the way and unbolted all the, all the, all the, <laughs> the pipes. So. Every single one of them, okay. And then, of course, she takes the nuts and throws them away so nobody <laughs> knows how to replace it. Okay, so um, uh, on the left is uh, a, uh, a puzzle feeder, one of our earlier uh, projects. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show that again in a minute. So, um, okay, there's the, 
Yeah, okay. So here, here's the, the kind of scene we have is, is that when we've installed them, the elephants have been inside the barn, and they hear us outside, and they can smell the Mass Art students. So they know it's going to be like Christmas morning. They go outside, and there'll be a lot of toys out there. So as soon as they open the door, they go out there and start, you know, futtering with them and playing with them. We want to show, we got to show them having some fun. Yes. Yeah. Yep, I'm, I'm down by Emily, who has the... Oh, what? Come on, lazy boy. Move your butt. Okay. Okay, my mind. So there's a lot of large students and then school groups behind. Oh, right there, I think they have another success. Yeah, they're good. Joey, <laughs> 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 this is only one out. <laughs> She gets it out. <laughs> yeah, she puts it in. She's the one that has to get it out. <laughs> Just like you, right? When you mess up your room, you're the one who cleans it, right? This is Emily. This is the big one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is uh, another, another uh, gyration, another year where we have the uh, tire tendril, the, uh, the jacks, and then the, also the, the bling. And uh, okay, here's, you can here see Ruth. This is, you can see Ruth's trunk, how what she's done is she gets it and she swings it up on top so, so she can rest the thing on top. Then she drapes the part that she can move down below. And this, in, it, we don't have this on film, but, but we, this happened. She, she realized that the, those things make noise, so she came over here and picked up that stick. And she took the stick and went back over there and started playing on it. So, and then also pounding with a drum. And, and this toy is designed to be, they can shove it around the yard yeah, with yeah. those big long it's, bottoms. And, and we were thinking they could flip them. I think it had been flipped at times, but they're old like machines. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 show the clip of the, uh, yeah, so this is. Okay. Here's another Okay. Here's a clip of uh, again Emily uh, dragging the tire tendril around. She likes to throw things on her back. Uh, I don't know if she's actually done that. I thought the keeper said that she had thrown this on her back, but I haven't seen it myself. It's pre it's pretty heavy, but not for her. In, in elephant time, everything's very slow. Yeah. <laughs> You can, you can see where her front feet are, are wet, about two feet up. So she actually went over to the pool and stepped in it. Often, though, what they do is they take the toys and just throw them in the pool. <laughs> and there you can see the toy rack with all the... Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, you see the toy rack back that's been dismantled. Yeah. This was a week after we delivered them. So yeah, yeah. when you deliver them, uh, they have to, you know, they kind of are like Christmas morning. And, 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 and uh, you know, you're, you're, the kid wants to play with the box and all. Also, the keepers kind of reinvent the toys sometimes. In this one, for example, the bling, which is also a food, you know, to create activity and uh, food that will roll out when they roll the, uh, the object. They also take it, stood it up upright, and then stick these sprigs in because this is how they get trees and food in, in, the, in, the, in, in the natural world. So they use this as a, as a, a, st a sort of a, a stick and uh, leaf feeder. Use this for a drum? Yeah. They use this for a drum, which was not intended to do, but they, uh, Ruth will go over there and pound on that uh, you know, quite frequently. And uh, you want to show this clip? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to probably have to stop. Yeah. A couple more things, yeah. This is... You see where it took six students to push this. This is nothing for, uh, for uh, Emily to do. Yeah. And, and she can smell the, there's uh, apples and oranges are inside that chamber. And this thing has to make two full rotations and then the fruit will start falling out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The students are cheering them over the yeah. side yeah. They're yeah. very excited. Yeah. This, this, is like, this is like the uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> For for uh, elephant toy makers. So I'm gonna go because yeah. uh, this is uh, uh -huh. 
the roll, this kind of roll like that and had fruit that fell out. And yeah. Those were pretty, and yeah, you can see now this is like the, uh, a couple years later with the, uh, the bling is getting, getting some uh, wear from being outside and used for all that time. So th this is a very special one, the, one of the first ones that was done. And uh, it's for Emily specifically and her desire to unbolt everything in the house. So, and this is sped up because this took about 15 minutes, but you'll see it's, oops, oh shoot. That, that's, that's a, You gave it away. Okay. So now this is inside the, the barn. Now that's sped up. <laughs> and she's going to unscrew that bolt. It's amazing. You see how she takes her and makes the. And she's actually uh, been known to take things apart in her pen, so they really have to, uh, you know, uh, fix and have fasteners that aren't unscrewed. So letting her do something for fun that she's kind of gets fussed at is, uh, was the idea. This is what she wants to do. Let's figure out something for her to do. It's not easy to get inside. She knows there's something. She can smell the food inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Once she gets inside, that other triangle, the other pyramid also has a bolt, and you open it up again. So, so there's, you there's the. And that one is still, I think they're still yeah, using yeah, that. Yeah, this has been a very popular tool. They this is one of the, out, yeah, this, do her thing, take it away. Yeah, this has been there for seven years, so this is a good one. Uh, so again, this is uh, the, the, now the view behind the fence. This is the school kids. This is the, the public observing that day. These are some photographs of our groups. Not all of them, but uh, over the years, our groups. And um, sometimes they're larger than others and other faculty in, involved. And this is, you know, so the question is, what is the future for Toys for Elephants? Well, we think that it has a great future. You know, in, in the seven years we've been doing this, we've been getting uh, emails from, uh, from New Zealand, from Australia, from Germany, all over the U.S., uh, from Thailand, asking about our projects, other universities, other students want to get involved. And so our, our big idea is, is that we believe um, Hans House would like to coordinate and collaborate with other institutions and have other design schools and other universities working with local zoos and, and become a more comprehensive study because we've been, uh, we've been working with only two elephants. And you can imagine you go to different zoos and they have a different herd. And each of those herd is full of uh, creatures as, as unique as Emily and Ruth. And each one of those we would work, you would work with, you would get more and more information. And the more elephants you work with, the, the uh, more you can advance this idea about enrichment. So, um, so I think that's it. <laughs> so if you have any questions, we're happy to, to answer you if you have time. Yes. Yeah, very good question. Um, okay, uh, let me go back to, you know, we are makers, and, and ignore that hand. Uh, so so uh, we're not really good at fundraising. That hasn't been our expertise. Uh, but our funding has come from private donors and from some funding from, um, uh, Hans House has funded most of these projects. Uh, but, uh, Han but Hans House has also got funding for other projects from private funding and from some grants and but uh, we, 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 uh, we have our, uh, our development officer right here who today, uh, who we're, we're now trying to go, to go out and find sources for uh, funding. We, we, we are a, uh, a big organization with two people. Yeah, can I say one second? And the two people are makers and love doing the project. So that, that's kind of, uh, yeah. the, the funding is, is our... Yeah. Is something that, that can I say one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. Well, one thing we would like to do is, I believe, if we did uh, get a number of institutions involved, and, and, and more more biologists, more veterinarians, uh, more scientists, and more art schools, that we probably probably could fund go to like the National Science Foundation 
and get a big grant to fund all those institutions doing you know, research uh, to, to move this uh, whole idea forward. So, yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>